Hello. I'm very glad that you've been here for Sunday school today. And you had somebody to be with you. So that's great. Yeah. So I have a book this morning called Have You Seen Birds? Maybe the choir can see it up there. Thank you, Brenda. That's great. That's great because the pictures are awesome. This book is written by Joanne Oppenheimer and the illustrations are done by Barbara Reed. So maybe one of you can kind of see closely what kind of art she did to make the pictures in the book. Can you tell what it is? I think maybe like clay. Yeah, she's used clay to make these amazing pictures. Maybe I'll bring the book downstairs after at coffee time if people want to see it more closely. I thought of this book because this advent you're thinking about birds as a way to enter more deeply into the Advent story and stories and to think about each of our Advent symbols. And I love this book. I read it a lot of times when my kids were small. Um, but I think that the title has more to it than you think at first. Have you seen birds? Yes. Have you seen birds? Have you seen birds at the back? Yes, everyone seen has everyone seen birds anyone who hasn't seen birds. But do we always really see birds have you seen birds like for me paying attention is a really important way of praying. It helps us to understand how God is in the world how every time is sacred if we really see things so today we're going to think about really seeing birds and Barbara reads amazing artwork helps us to do that. So how are we going to do this? If I do this, because then well it's on no one else is really going to see it. But how's that? Have you seen birds? Long legged tall birds, tiny bug sized small birds, brightly breasted, gaily crested, meadow tan or fancy fan. Have you seen birds? Have you seen spring birds? Fluffy, cheeping, sleeping, peeping, ever eating baby birds, or early summer garden birds, nesting snugly in the shrubs, pulling worms and snapping grubs, finding food to feed the brood, drinking, singing, splashing, swinging. Have you seen birds? Have you seen autumn birds? Visiting the feeder birds, following the leader birds, leaving in a string birds, coming back in spring birds. Have you seen birds? Have you seen winter birds? searching snow and tapping bark perching puffed in freezing dark winter birds need lots of feed scraps of fat and sacks of seed have you seen snowbirds they're all still here Ooh. have you heard the night birds moved by moonlight bright birds scaring rabbits into holes, hunting bats and rats and moles. Have you heard the haunting of the hunting nighttime birds? Have you heard town birds rapping at the park, at the bark birds, cooing in the park birds, quarreling in a rage birds, tweeting in a cage birds, Squeaking, squawking, screeching, talking. Have you heard birds? Have you seen farm birds? Scratching, clucking, pecking, strutting, cockadoodle barn birds. And on beyond the barn birds, what about the field birds? Field, <laughs> field behind the barn birds, cricket catching, berry snatching, whistling, from a thorny thistle. Have you seen birds? Have you seen marsh birds? Web foot paddling water birds, walking with a waddle birds, wading in the reeds. Do you know seabirds twisting, drifting, swiftly sifting? 
de searching, skimming, scooping, lifting, soaring by the shore. Or flat footed fishing birds fussing, chatting, flipper flapping, diving for their food. Have you seen these birds? Look up, see the sky birds flying way up high birds racing up to space birds, wind wheeling, freedom feeling, diving, dipping, gliding, tipping. Have you seen birds? A band, a flight, a flock of birds. The world is full of lots of birds. Have you seen birds? <laughs> I hope this story will help us to pay attention to God's wonderful world as we watch it from inside and experience it outside during this Advent season. And our paying attention will help us wonder about all God's goodness. And when we pay attention to birds, it's amazing just how many there are, even in the winter. And it is amazing, God's creativity in the world. We have a responsive reading. I think it'll be on the screen. Maybe, maybe it's, is it in your bulletin, Brent? You don't have a rig, I have it here, but. So I'm gonna say a part and then you're gonna say a light of hope in me, a light of hope in you. And we'll point to ourselves and to other people. You can sit up here with me if you like. The light of Christ is shining, something sacred, something new. A light of hope in me, a light of hope in you. The light of Christ is beaming with a radiance pure and true. A light of hope in me, a light of hope in you. The light of Christ is blessing who we are and what we do. A light of hope in me, a light of hope in you. Thanks for coming, sharing the story. Now we'll have our Advent candle lighting. During Advent, we are inspired by the wonder of birds. Do you ever wonder why birds wake up so early in the morning and start singing just before the sun comes up? Some people think they like to sing in the dark because no one can see them. Maybe they have stage fright like some people do. But the dark is scary too. Why would they sing in the shadows? It's true that shadows can feel scary, but birds know that shadows can also be safe hiding places from animals who would hurt them. Do you think that shadows can be safe places for people too? While no one is noticing us in our own dark shadows, maybe we could take time to do things that quietly build hope. Things like praying and learning and connecting and even trying something new and making mistakes. I never thought the dark as being a safe place. Listen to what Paul wrote to the church in Rome. Besides this, you know what time it is, how it is now the moment for you to wake from sleep, for salvation is nearer to us now than when we became believers. The night is far gone, the day is near. In these Advent days with long nights, what if we woke up to God's love and justice? and started to be people of hope, lifting our voices to sing that the night is far gone and the day is near. How would we do that? Here are some ways to start. Think about what you are feeling most hopeful about these days. Consider your favorite bird song. What song gives you a sense of hope when you hear it or sing it. 
as I wonder about hope, we light this first Advent candle and learn from the Cardinal of Hope. Let us pray. God of light and wings, we pray for everyone who feels discouraged. Help us become cardinals of hope for a weary world. In Jesus', Jesus name, amen. You got the working title for my sermon, Keep Awake, Be Ready, which is a really good summary of the message that was just read to us from Matthew's gospel. But yesterday when I was walking, I thought of a better title. So I have to tell you, take your foot off the accelerator. Hope is the thing with feathers that perches in the soul and sings the tune without the words and never stops at all. Hope is the thing with feathers that perches in the soul and sings the tune without the words and never stops at all. How can this time of worship and these weeks of Advent waiting help us make room for hope in our hearts and in our world. How can we embrace this time as sacred, filled to the brim and overflowing with God's intention and attention for the world God loves and for each one of us? Here's some words that might echo the sense of urgency in that scripture from Matthew 24. And perhaps you heard some of these words in the past weeks. Adaptation, mitigation, loss and damage, catastrophic climate change. On the highway to hell with our foot on the accelerator. When UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres opened COP27 in Egypt earlier this month, he welcomed thousands of delegates, observers, and activists to the latest UN Global Climate Conference with these dire words. His words are reminiscent of the alarming language that we find in today's gospel reading from Matthew. These words are characteristic of other apocalyptic writings in the Bible that capture a sense of urgency and crisis so appropriate to Jesus' time and to our time. Our gospel lesson is filled with language that is intended to grab our attention and hold our attention on what God is doing and what we are called to do and be in service to the kingdom of God that Jesus embodied, Jesus incarnate in the world, God with skin on. The strong language and imagery of Matthew 24 rings an alarm for people who might be getting weary and inclined to drift off to sleep. Enter hope. 
you know anyone named Hope? Perhaps there is a Hope or two worshiping with us this morning. What a bold name to give a child. What a bold claim to make on our lives and our living. Yet we will boldly light the first candle of Advent this morning, a candle for hope. And we will boldly leave this place to pay attention to how God will be making hope manifest in us and in our community, in our work and our relationships, at rest and at play here, now. Over the past few weeks, our COP27 delegates have surprised me with their hopeful language and their willingness to spend their time and energy in the service of climate justice. The United Church of Canada has accreditation status with the COP27 Global Climate Conference. And this year, our denomination chose to use that accreditation status to ensure that a global ecumenical delegation would be present to represent our church and other churches in Egypt. We worked with our ecumenical partners, Kairos, and For the Love of Creation, to ensure the strong voice of young Indigenous people like Tia Kennedy and Clifford Mushkwa from Canada would be included in the conference, working alongside church partners from the Global South, together calling with many, many other voices for strong implementation of the climate justice commitments that we hoped would be made while people gathered in Egypt. Tia Kennedy from Walpole Island First Nation in Ontario commits to make the future better than the past, a real world application of the theology that names all time as sacred time. When Tia met Canada's Minister of Environment and Climate Change in an informal gathering during the COP meeting, she seized on the opportunity to talk with him, to tell him about her community. And when he commented that he just couldn't imagine what it would be like to live there and have to deal with those issues, she just boldly asked him to come and visit. And he said he would in front of some witnesses. So she is very hopeful that he will do just that. And I hope he does, because he will learn a lot from this young woman. Kelly Campo from Colombia, one of our global partners through Kairos, boldly proclaimed hope in the same strong voice and moment that she proclaimed urgency. There's no more time to talk about the climate crisis, she cried. And this hope wasn't an attitude that was reserved for the young or for delegates who are people of faith. I heard that word hope so many times from other delegates, from government and non-governmental organizations, and from the media who were reporting on it, embracing hope as a critical ingredient for continuing to move forward on this pressing issue. I took note, stopped me in my tracks when I was listening to the radio and doing some busy project in the kitchen. But the Pakistani climate minister stopped me and I listened carefully when she proclaimed, without hope, we cannot make a plan. Apocalyptic writings in the Bible and by contemporary writers too, you might think of the Left Behind series of books and movies and um, not something I've read, but very, very popular. These kind of writings sometimes distract us with incredible accounts of the end times and the rapture, giving us disturbing images of the of violent end of this world and a tumultuous beginning of a whole new time where some are left behind. 
But many biblical scholars challenge this reading of these apocalyptic writings, including our passage from Matthew 24. There is indeed an urgency in today's message. And at the same time, a need to go slowly and carefully, sometimes to simply be in the present moment. A wise elder in a conversation about reconciliation a few years back made a comment that has stayed with me. Sometimes things are so important and so pressing that we need to go slowly. Counterintuitive, but we shouldn't be surprised to find things counterintuitive in the gospel of Jesus who like to turn things upside down. The language of Matthew's gospel sets us firmly in the present, the now, this sacred time. This is the time to be awake. This is our time to remain watchful, to be ready without the comfort of knowing the future. What time is it? Sacred time. Something new is happening all around us, every day and every night, every moment, inviting, even demanding our undivided attention. Let's return to Emily Dickinson for a last word. Hope is the thing with feathers that perches in the soul and sings the tune without the words and never stops at all. And sweetest in the gale is heard and sore must be the storm that could abash the little bird that kept so many warm. I've heard it in the chillest land and on the strangest sea, yet never in extremity it asked a crumb of me. Amen. Oh,